What's up, everybody? My name is Christian Harvey, founder of Amplify Black Voices. I'm here with Post One at Large, Councilman Michael Julian Bond. And today we are with the Andrew Young Center of Global Leadership on the More Conversations podcast. How are you today? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing well. So, Councilman, your family's legacy in Atlanta politics is truly remarkable. How do you feel this legacy has influenced your approach to, approach to public service? And what values do you strive to uphold and to, as a continuation of this tradition? Well, you know, I, my experience uh, with my parents, with my ex grandparents and extended family, like everyone else, shaped me. And particularly growing up the way that I did here in Atlanta. Both of my parents were activists in the Atlanta Student Movement and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. My grandparents, my grandfather, Dr. Horace Mann Bond, uh, was a close associate of Thurgood Marshall. He did the academic research for the Brown versus the Board of Education. He was a member of the NAACP. He uh, was a college president, was always advocating uh, for education. My grandmother, likewise, uh, was, you know, a, a, an academic scholar and, and an activist in her own right. And so in that household, you know, talking about civil rights and public service, uh, you know, was an everyday conversation. And I was exposed to a lot of people who were either active in the civil rights movement active in academia or in politics and so it felt very natural very plain and of course where i grew up here in atlanta adjacent to the campus uh, first over on jephthah street then on yearly street and then on sunset avenue on the opposite side of the campus over by morris brown uh, you know this was my world and mm -hmm. so i was always surrounded by um, academic and political thought and, and actors. And can't underscore how Pascal's, the original Pascal's restaurant and hotel played a role in that because we were often on Old Hunter Street, which is now Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, in one of those restaurants is either Alex Barbecue Heaven, the Busy Bee, the original Busy Bee, or Pascal's. But Pascal's in particular uh, because Pascal's was the crossroads of not only black Atlanta, but black America. Mm. Uh, because it's dignitaries from around the country, you know, political, movies, TV, you know, singers, whatever. Uh, everybody came through Pascal's. And so you could sit in a booth at Pascal's and see local characters to national and international figures coming through there having the chicken and the collard greens or you know they being there for a reason uh for any reason and you had access to them and so i had a lot of exposure uh to that world and growing up in that uh, you hear the stories you meet the people who were involved in the history uh you know at w whatever field that they were in and it, it does affect you, right? Because you learn about how people in whatever phase, whether it's politics or pure activism, have given their lives or you know, dedicated themselves to purposes higher than themselves and beyond you know, their, their, the, the needs of their own personal lives. And so that, get, I know that was a lot, but mm -hmm. That world is what shaped me and want to go into public service. Now, I didn't think that I would be in elected service as long as I have, but you know, I figured I would always be active. I was active in the as a youth in the NAACP on the youth council, the student council at school, etc. Follow my dad around a lot, being active uh, with him as he went around the city and did different things. But I never thought that I would totally give um, you know my time and everything to public service the way that I have and I, I do it because of those experiences that I mentioned mm -hmm. the people that I have met and known and that were mentoring me when I didn't know that I was being mentored you know yeah. 
yeah, and had, had their hand on me, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I enjoy it and I love it. I guess speaking on your tenure as councilman, I would assume that you've seen the city span some significant changes. Uh, which of those has been most memorable as you, uh, for you to witness during your time in office? Well, it's, it's twofold. It's really a, a tale of two cities. Uh, on the one hand, when I was first elected, the Olympics was looming. Mm. Was, was, I was elected in uh, the fall of 93, sworn in in January of 94. The Olympics were two, two years away. Mm -hmm. the, to see the city uh, from an outsider perspective as a regular citizen beforehand, and then being elected as what might be considered an insider, to see the, the way the city galvanized itself in preparation for that. And the, you know, and the metro area because it was you know spread out amongst the metro area, and that dynamic really shifted Atlanta from being a big southern city, but still a big small town, into a world class city. Literally overnight, you could see it. You know, you could feel the energy in the city. You could feel the energy in the people. You know, whether they were a part of the Olympic Committee or an Olympic uh, employee or not, mm -hmm. everybody had that electricity running through their veins. Everybody was excited about it and looking forward to it. And then there were a lot of conversations, particularly here around the Atlanta University Center area, about the quality of the Olympic experience for residents. As the District 3 council person that was in the district then, um, they were having the conversations around the Atlanta University Center about equity in the Olympics and how does, you know, you, you've got this Olympic venue at Georgia Tech that was happening, the swimming. You had things that were going on at University of Georgia and other state schools. But at the time uh, when the Olympics was announced, there weren't any facilities uh, or any activities centered around the Atlanta University Center, which is formative of Atlanta's identity and a part of Atlanta's culture. And to see uh, the African American community and advocate for itself uh, to get a piece of this great Olympic pie that Atlanta would not have if not for the same African American leadership that was able to garner the votes in Africa to give Atlanta the edge over, you know, the sentimental favorite, which was Athens, Greece, where the Olympics were created. Um, you know, it was inspiring because uh, the community, our community stepped up to the plate and was able to get, you know, that and other victories um, as a piece of the pie. And, but also with that, we saw uh, quality development by black developers uh, building affordable housing, building new housing around the city, uh, being engaged in working in communities. But as time has gone on, we've also seen, uh, you know, that would probably be the end of the era of what I would consider white flight or what a, a social scientist might consider white flight from Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, having begun in the 1960s where the population uh, was dipping. Uh, but from the Olympics, it's, it's actually skyrocketed. So present day Atlanta is at the population level uh, that it was when the white flight actually began mm. and in the civil rights uh, era. And so you, we, we, we've seen that kind of go 360 now. Uh, there, there is a factoid about the Olympics that says that in every Olympic city, once the Olympics is held, uh, about 30% of those who come to those Olympics resettle in that particular city. Well, in Atlanta, I believe that's twofold that has happened. And so there are people moving to the Atlanta metropolitan area, about 80,000 people a month that they estimate. And so and that goes back to that Olympic experience. But on the other side of the coin, we've also seen that even though there's been an influx, great influx of population to our city proper, uh, we've seen that there has been a gap that has developed 
uh, because those that had means and could move have moved. And we have those who cannot that are struggling to hold on in our city every day. Because of the influx of interest in redeveloping property and people feeling that they could get a investment, uh, you know, a good return on their real estate, property values in Atlanta have skyrocketed. And so affordable housing, again, that meant one thing in the 90s, means something much more intense and, and it is a much more serious problem than it than today than it was back then. And so the struggle to develop affordable housing to make sure that legacy residents or just regular working people can keep Atlanta as their home, I believe is a major struggle for the city today. So in that I hear Atlanta, like many cities, is grappling with some issues around inequality and systemic injustice. Uh, in your opinion, what are some of the root causes of these challenges and in what ways could the youth step in? And if do you believe that that is necessary to address this effectively at the municipal level? Oh, definitely. I, I think uh, the conversation we're having around aff uh, Atlanta's affordability and opportunities to move from what are the lower income stratas in Atlanta to through, through the course of a life or a career and move to the higher echelons, uh, to the middle and upper middle classes, is, is got to be a number one priority for all policy makers. Um, Atlanta has always been a city that has been high in the poverty level. And a lot of people miss that it, it, under you know, we rejoice in being, of course, the black mecca for black business, a black mecca for entrepreneurship. And, you know, my own father said, you know, Atlanta's a great place if you've got an education, if you've got a degree. Because people forget in, this, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, Atlanta was second in poverty only to Newark, New Jersey. And that, and that is missed by a lot of people. Now that was in part due to the amount of public housing uh, that was in Atlanta. There was an inordinate amount of uh, public housing in Atlanta that kind of drove that statistic. But the point is still that you have to have the tools within our school system. People have to be able to avail themselves of our education system, whether that is our uh, state schools and of course the greatest uh, consortium of African-American institutions in the world, people have to be able to access that. Yeah. People have to be able to know that they have an opportunity and can get into and get an education at these particular institutions. And even our um, technical colleges and vocational schools that are here have to have the capacity uh, to bring people in and to uh, help them get the skills they need so they can have, you know, a, a full and fulfilling life. And so that is an ongoing challenge in Atlanta, and it's one that, you know, the whole community uh, has to address, particularly policymakers who have that authority. And so on the municipal level, uh, we have to make sure that we're doing everything that we can, even though the city doesn't, uh, we're not affiliated with the Atlanta public school system, you know, legally anymore, we still have an invested interest in making sure that that school system is preparing every Atlanta child with the same, if, you know, if not equal tools for them to be successful when they move beyond that system. And so, and of course, we have to make sure that the state schools, the, the vocational schools that we have here that are serving our population are doing an ever improving job so that people can access that education and you know of course equip themselves for the rest of their lives in addressing the topics around policy throughout your career i would assume that you've been involved in numerous controversial decisions and debates looking back is there a particular moment that stands out to you as especially challenging or divisive and how do we navigate through it while honoring the principles of democracy and justice? Well, there, there are two uh, votes 
that at the very first day that I was on the city council and one, I guess, a year ago almost, uh, that would probably be the most controversial. Uh, when I was the first day that I attended a, a city council meeting after being sworn in, there was a tremendous issue in the African-American community uh, around uh, environmental justice. It was a plan to for the city to deal with this aging sewer and water sewer infrastructure. They were gonna build a tunnel uh, from basically what is the, I guess the um, Mount Perrin kind of Northside Drive area going all the way down to Utoy Creek, down to Southwest Atlanta, so that the city, the city had inadequate facilities to treat the amount of wastewater, sewage water uh, that we were having to deal with. And so the idea was that you would build this tunnel, send the affluent down, and then pump it back up mm -hmm. as you know, you, you're able to treat it, mm -hmm. right? And it's a good theory, and it works in a, it works in a lot of places, but environmentalists, um, policymakers, elected officials, community people were concerned about the plan, and so on this very first day, the council chamber was packed to the rafters, and there was no limit on uh, public comment. The fire marshal did not come into the chamber <laughs> to clear the pathway. You literally had people sitting in the rostrum, in the aisles, and in the media crow's desk, mm -hmm. you know, just there. And we were there for hours and hours and hours, uh, you know, for a public comment about uh, the vote. And the then mayor, Mayor Campbell, this was his, you know, he was just sworn in, taking over for uh, Maynard Jackson. And something happened between the transition from Maynard leaving from his third term and people being like, well, you know, uh, you know, not really knowing how they felt about it. Till two weeks later, once Bill is, <laughs> is sworn in to, you know, it was akin to an old Frankenstein movie, you know, where the people are bringing the torches, mm -hmm. the torches out. And so people wanted to know where, where we were going to stand, where we were going to let them build uh, this sewer tunnel. Uh, because then we were under the threat that uh, we might be put under a consent decree by the federal government and they would force us to deal because there was a group, uh, Chattahoochee River Keepers, who were threatening uh, to sue Atlanta over this, the, the water, that, the, the quality of water that we, tr that we uh, treat to put back in the Chattahoochee. And it was really kind of an unfair lawsuit because where our water sewer plant is that treats wastewater is right across the uh, river from Fulton Counties. And so though they were monitoring where we would put water in, you know, down river, you know, Fulton County is putting in, you know, untreated sewer water also. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of getting the blame, you know, for that. But ultimately uh, we had to make a vote that meeting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was tough because I'd never been in that, that kind of environment. And so we voted not to build that tunnel and responded to the community. Now, uh, probably in June of this past year, there was a vote on the Public Safety Training Center uh, financing that we had voted to build two years ago prior to our election, um, I guess two years ago would have been 2021, yeah, and our, yeah, 2020, so that was a heated debate, uh, but, you know, that vote went through and six months, uh, less than six months later, we faced election and pretty much everybody got reelected. And you know, people are like, well, you, you're gonna build it. Something happened between that particular vote and the vote in June where this facility uh, was really uh, likened to the Death Star uh, for uh, the community. I mean, everything and I anything that could be wrong with uh, a building, whether it was, it, it, there were environmental uh, concerns from environmentalists. There were people who were a part of the uh, defund the police effort, people who were uh, reform police effort. So all these groups came together uh, to oppose the financing 
uh, wanting to stop the construction of the facility. And that was a very controversial vote because the debate about whether or not that we needed a new training center for our police and our firefighters, I mean, it goes back 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. And because our police facility is 70 years old, 80 years old, and we lost our firefighter training facilities in a, in a uh, dispute with the Atlanta Public School System over property deeds. Because back in the past, the school system and the city were, they were a board of the city of Atlanta. And so they weren't independent. And so we held all the deeds over the years as they have gained greater and greater independence. And finally in 04, uh, their charter was amended to make them completely independent. There was still a dispute about who owned what property. That came to a head during the Reed administration and the school system, our firefighters and fire apparatus were all on what was deemed APS property. And so that came to a head and APS didn't renew the leases. So we lost all of the facilities to train our firefighters on. So we had to set up mutual aid agreements with fire departments from all around the metropolitan region. And that impacts your ability to recruit because if you got somebody who, go, who wants to come and work for you, even though you're the number one fire department in the, in the state, but you've got to go over to Douglas County one day, Cherokee County the next day, you know, so people are like, well, you know, forget this, I can just go work for Cherokee County or I can just go work at Douglas County or I can just go work in Decatur, you know, and go to one place and be trained and, and, and work there. So on top of that, 20 years ago, uh, the site that the uh, facility was planned to be built upon was our corrections facility. Uh, it was 85 acres. Uh, it was basically an old farm. You know, there had been, um, I don't want to say it was a chain gang, but it was a work farm for municipal offenders up until Maynard came in the first time mm -hmm. and shut the farm down. But the the city's prison, um, you know, was like akin to a big Mayberry prison, mm -hmm. right? You know, they see on Andy Griff. I mean, it was literally, you know, like that. Uh, was out there and so when it when it was mothballed for the city's new uh, Atlanta um, detention center environmentalists said you know what this is a beautiful piece of land it's three it's 280 acres we ought to preserve it and so there was a blue ribbon commission set up to look at doing that but independent of that blue ribbon commission with the environmentalists people in the public safety space at the city said, you know what, our facilities are crumbling. We're facing OSHA uh, complaints, you know, from our employees. We got to build a new facility. And so these two tracks, you know, people are running on these two tracks and they're coming to a head. As the approval under the Bottoms administration that followed Reed to build the facility came, then you had the year of activism uh, around the country, you know, because of the deaths of George Floyd and many others, you know, around the country. You know, this was probably the worst time in the world to be considering building a public, anything related to police because of the, the tenor and tone of the country had changed. And so the vote in the summer really wasn't about building the facility because the city had already done that, already committed to the contract. It was about approving the financing deal. Uh, but we had activists come down, probably about almost 700 people came down, packed the chamber again as uh, the fire marshal did come that time, keep the aisles clear and they uh, didn't let it get as full, but it was intense. And so we listened to about 15 hours of public comment. And what we had discovered really over this two year period from when we did the initial approval to this particular vote is that there was so much misinformation uh, about the purpose of the facility, how we got to that point, you know, why we're not doing the environmental plan that the, the Blue Ribbon Commission wanted us to do versus building the facility. 
all of this has been skewed. There have been a lot of propaganda about it. But at the end of the day, we were obligated and had to build a facility. And so after about 15 hours of public comment, we voted uh, to go ahead and, com and uh, commence with the deal. And that had been divisive among some parts of Atlanta. And, and that's sad because on the one hand, at the first instance with the sewer tunnel, you know, there's a tradition in Atlanta called the Atlanta Way, mm -hmm. right? And the Atlanta Way is that you sit down, you negotiate, you talk uh, with those who are your opponents and try to work out an accommodation. During the environmental issues with the sewer tunnel, after that vote went down, the Atlanta Way was employed in mass, mm -hmm. right? They began to negotiate with um, the, there were for, former county commission uh, member Emma Dar the great Emma Darnell, you know, she was leading the charge for some of the black environmentalists, some of the neighborhood groups. Uh, all these people began to sit down with the administration and hashed out and worked out the issues. And so prior to um, being sued by the river keepers to deal with that water sewer issue, an accommodation was reached, right? And so we were able to make improvements in the system and build other, not complete tunnels, but other shafts to hold water in other parts of town, which people say, hey, why can't you do this somewhere else? We were able to do that and work that out. What hasn't happened on the public safety training center side is that it really hasn't been that dialogue, you know, at any point. You know, there's been a lot of protests, there's been a lot of political action. Uh, there's even, there's been violence and unfortunately, uh, a young man lost his life, you know, on DeKalb County's property out in, that abuts our property uh, out there in DeKalb County. But there just doesn't seem to have been that type of engagement, um, you know, across the table. There, you know, there have been smaller groups and smaller people, but, you know, it's just been unfortunate to me, having seen in my career, that the things that work that work not really being employed or tried in this particular time. So even though, you know, we had to vote to support it, as a matter of fact, the original vote, I think, was 10 to 4 to approve the facility. Uh, the vote last summer, it actually went up. It was 11 to 3. You know, more people were supportive. But it's just disappointing to see that these things that have served Atlanta so well, these tactics, these uh, these practices just haven't been employed. So that was disappointing. Well, Councilman Bond, your insights into community empowerment and uh, historical preservation as well have been invaluable. Um, and considering the upcoming Charette Project and the Amplify Black Voices uh, Eco Museum Initiative, how do you envision the city's role in fostering dialogue and collaboration to possibly address a new Atlanta way? Well, I think what we have to do in any instance in our lives is look at what has worked and served us well. And we have to pass on that knowledge, those practices, on to those who are coming behind us. Uh, because, you know, it's the old uh, cliche, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? You want to make sure that things that have worked and served the community continue to work and serve the community. Things that have to be uh, uh, people that, that need, I don't want to say train, but people need to be uh, taught what has worked so that they in turn can improve upon it and use those same skills to keep the community the way it is. I mean, Atlanta is, you know, the mayor says it's a group project, but it's also an intentional group project. It's, it, you know, the city of Atlanta, the, 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 the history, the, the, the great greatness that has come from this city has been intentional. You know, it's not happenstance um, that we have, you know, black, good, solid black middle class here. It's not, it's not happenstance that we have, you know, some of the, the, the highest uh, black intellectual minds here because of the Atlanta University Center. And that attracts more, uh, you know, intellectuals. That attracts more people for business. That attracts more entrepreneurs. 
you know, th there's a reason for that. There's a reason why people who came to school here stayed uh, because there were black institutions because of segregation and Jim Crow laws that were forced and crucible to serve the black community when the white, when the larger community would not, whether that was through insurance or banking or financing homes, financing businesses, uh, you know, when whites would redline our communities, you know, those things happened on purpose. You know, just to, to, today as in the past, musicians invest, investing in banking, musicians, you know, you know, the celebrities of the times, you know, just like back in the 19 teens and 20s would invest and, and create businesses uh, to accommodate our community. And so the intentionality of the march towards success and uplift of our community has to be maintained. It, people have to be educated about it. People have to know that, you know, it's almost like if you're uh, trying to carve a figure out of marble, every blow, every tool you use to free that figure from the marble is an intentional mark on that, on that block of marble. Nothing is by accident, and it continues. You have to turn and do a 360-degree survey of every time that you're making your mark, you know, on, on that edifice. And so we have to continue to do that as a community. We have to continue to do that as a city. That's all we have for today. I'm Christian Harvey here with Councilman Bond. Thank you for the podcast. Thank you. We're on the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership, More Conversations podcast. Thank you. Hey.